Queen Mary is the oldest surviving transatlantic liner, one of the great ships that plied the ocean routes at high speed, in old world luxury and in all weathers. Little bit of England floating across the Atlantic. She now rests in gentle retirement in the warm sunshine of Long Beach, California, as a hotel and tourist attraction. The Queen Mary is a reminder of the post-war decades when national pride and prestige were at stake as countries competed to build the most magnificent ships on the great ocean routes. Come on in, come on in. This was the social and the shopping area for the first class passengers and only for the first class passengers. Before the jet age, liners carried passengers and goods en masse across the oceans from A to B. They linked the world, essentially, and they made the modern world possible. The Americans, with the steamship United States, had the fastest. The Dutch had the elegant Rotterdam, the Italians the sleek Michelangelo, and the French had the France as their supreme symbol of national culture and cuisine. Great ships that, like the Queen Mary, were envied, admired, and even loved. The coming of the jetliner and the 60s assault on class and privilege should have swept this world away, but somehow it clung on. Today, more people than ever travel on big ships, ships that have a modern take on glamour and romance. The beauty of these ships is that they are technological masterpieces. Each has a character and a personality of their own, and they become much loved by the people who travel in them. And one great liner still travels the North Atlantic. Against the odds, the Queen Mary II carries on in the grand tradition of the long-gone liners of old. As peace dawned after the Second World War, Britain alone was ready to reopen the great sea route between the old and the new worlds, firm in the belief that pre-war elegance and glamour could be seamlessly welded to a post-war world. On July 29th, the Mary left Southampton on a two-day trial trip in the Channel. From Captain C.G. Illingworth downwards, through a crew of 1,260, everybody was busy getting used to their jobs on the reconverted liner. BBC cameras on board recorded these typical scenes. Soon, everything was going on much as it did in the pre-war days, and as it will on many an Atlantic crossing in the future. At the end of the Second World War, Cunard's Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth practically had the Atlantic to themselves. They were the last of the large prestigious liners to have survived intact from the 1930s with their original owners. With the Elizabeth and the Mary, the Cunard line had both the largest and the fastest liners afloat. And with their associations of royalty, they were an ad man's dream. For a few short years, these ships maintained the illusion that Britain still ruled the waves. The Queen Mary had a real aura. Um, there was a whole generation of, of people who absolutely adored her. She had that glorious rich timber interior, slightly old-fashioned when it was put in, and it appealed to the class of people that she was built to attract. I do have a strong af affection for the Queen Mary, the first Queen Mary, which of course is now in Long Beach as a floating hotel. 
convention center and all the rest of it. And when you go there, you see this huge black hull with literally millions of rivets. She, was, she wasn't welded, she was riveted. And these three huge Cunard red funnels. And you go on board and it is like stepping back into the 1930s, the 1940s, when she was in her heyday, when she was the fastest passenger ship in the world. Are we ready, guys? Very good. This way, please. This is the behind the scenes, yes. And if you get one of the original cabins, uh, as you stay at the hotel, uh, again, you could imagine yourself in the 1930s. It, the taps tap for salt water as well as fresh water, uh, a myriad of taps and so on, this, this huge bath uh, rather than just a, a shower. And uh, it, it is, it, it's a wonderful experience. Also in the bathrooms at that time, the towel racks were electrically heated. When you step out of the tub, you would have a nice warm towel to wrap yourself in. During the war, the United States had to rely on the great Cunard liners to move her army across the Atlantic for the D-Day landings. Her war record is phenomenal. In July of 1943, she carried 16,683 human beings. That still stands as the largest number of human beings ever transported on one vessel in the history of the world. In the growing chill of the Cold War, America wanted her own independent means of moving armies. A ship that, like the two queens, could transport whole divisions so fast that no submarine could threaten her. In 1952, she launched the largest American passenger ship ever built, the SS United States, a passenger liner that could be converted within 18 hours to work as a troop ship. Winston Churchill is said that the Cunard Queens during the war collectively shortened the war by nearly a year because of their huge transport potential. And certainly after the war, the Americans seized on this and decided they had to have a ship of their own. And so funds were appropriated and directed to the United States lines to build a new troop ship come liner, which was the SS United States. In true American tradition, this baby was fast and a real gas guzzler. On her maiden voyage, she smashed the Atlantic record known as the Blue Ribbon, taking 10 hours off the Queen Mary's time and set a record for a passenger liner that remains unchallenged to this day. The main attraction of the United States was her speed. The accommodation was very modern, very tastefully decorated, but in comparison to the Queen's and the other great ships of state, it was rather austere. As a small boy, Naval architect Stephen Payne was captured on home cinefilm when the mighty United States sailed into Southampton. On sea trials, it's rumored that that ship achieved some 45 knots. Now, when you equate knots to miles per hour, it's over 50 miles per hour. And I always enjoy saying to my American friends that had that ship been sailing down an American highway in the 1950s, she would have got a speeding ticket. Designed for military action, she was fitted with aircraft carrier engines and fire-resistant asbestos replaced the opulent panelling of the Cunard Queens. The only wood on board the United States was said to be the piano and the butcher's block. What the United States had in terms of speed, um, I'm afraid she didn't match Queen Mary in terms of luxury. Luxury was what the Queen Mary was about, and in first class, it was about as good as it gets. 150 chefs cooking for critical, hungry mouths. Fair-paying passengers eating their money's worth all the way. Taking five days off and putting 14 pounds on. 
Oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Hope I see you in good health tonight. Yes. And I hope good appetite. Oh, always oh, that. That's a right. perfect move. I must uh, congratulate you gentlemen on your choice of your ladies. Well, we did huh? all right. <laughs> uh, now, what's it like aboard? Like the society she was built for, the Queen Mary is rigidly divided by class. First class, cabin class, and tourist. Only money makes it possible to rise from one class to another. No, that's the segregation gate, madam. Well, I don't think you can mix, mix um, well, carriages and, and, and the Regent Palace, can you, really? I suppose you can. <laughs> but if you're in the Regent Palace, you're in the Regent Palace, you're in carriages and carriages. If you want to travel first class, you can have a small cabin with no porthole for 178 pounds, but a suite for two people is over a thousand pounds, one way. If you don't feel up to the first class, there's the cabin class at the rear of the ship, gently vibrating over the propeller shafts. This costs 120 pounds or so. Squeezed up in the bows, there's room for 560 tourist passengers. There you can get a cabin for just under 100 pounds, but you'll probably have to share for five days. Life in the first class can be a round of cocktail parties, beginning with the captain's reception. Good evening, Mrs. Keegan. Welcome to you. Nice to see you. Join us, sir. Captain Shimmin, Mrs. Keegan. How do you do? Good evening, sir. How do you do? Would you both like to come through? Well, I believe, basically, they are three different kinds of people, yeah. You take a, a menu to a first-class passenger and he knows exactly what he wants. He can pick out things and he doesn't really require much explanation of the dishes. But if you show to a great majority of the tourist passengers, you show them the menu and they say, oh, what's this? You know, if it's in French, then they really don't understand the menu properly, which is quite in order. Everybody's happy to serve them. But you find that they are definitely different. Up in the first class, you can eat when you like, what you like, and as much as you like. Waldorf uh, salad. And I'll have the uh, artichoke. Well, that's true. Well, I think I'll have the uh, ribs of beef. Ribs of beef. Mm -hmm. Very well done, you know. When you they like it put well together. done. Cremated. Yes. You couldn't even fly across the Atlantic in those days, so you had the cream of all the world, the world's traffic, if you like, the European, American, the British traffic traveling in there. You had all the government officials, the actors, the actresses, all the chairmen of the, of the big companies, both American, European, and even the Russians used to travel with us in the main suites. Well, I don't think you would have such a gathering anywhere in the world as you did in those days. It used to be terribly chic and fun, and I'm snobby enough to like it. I mean, everyone dressed for dinner. Nowadays, people come down the most extraordinary clothes. You think every night looks like a fancy dress party. And, uh, oh, it used to be such fun. It was chic. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, you have just entered one of the most beautiful rooms on board this ship. She is three decks high. This room was filled with overstuffed chairs and couches. During the day, passengers would come into this room to socialize with other passengers or just to listen to music. Now, at that time, dinner was never, ever served in this room, but promptly at 4 p.m. each day, tea was served. And after the tea was served, they would play games, such as bingo. I stand looking, think lucky, you'll be lucky, the first lucky number. 2020, blind 60, 6060. Two little 
little ducks on the water, 22. The 50s were golden years for the Cunard line as post-war austerity blossomed into post-war boom. Soon every nation desired a share of the prestige and the profits. In the 50s, Manhattan became a parking lot for the finest liners the world had ever seen. The national flag carriers, the ships of state. So there was enormous competition between the great lines to see who could have the best ships and the ships that showed the better face of their countries of origin. The SS Rotterdam was the first of a new breed of European ships to carry their nation's flag and pride. The Holland America line succeeded not on speed or size, but by designing a dual-purpose ship that was at least a decade ahead of its time. The watchwords at the time were size and speed. You were either the biggest or you were the fastest. The Dutch said no, that era is over. And what they planned was a smaller ship, um, by today's standards, actually a very small ship, although in her day she was, she was in the top ten, but only just. And she wasn't particularly fast. She was designed to do the, the trip from Rotterdam to New York, I think, in seven or eight days, rather than the four and a half to five from Southampton that Cunard were, were doing. The Dutch alone seemed to see the future a future where the liner crossing had less importance and the real profits lay in cruising. With the Rotterdam, the Dutch had recast the role of the liner, but everyone else continued playing yesterday's game. The Italians dressed their national colours on the sleek Michelangelo and her companion, the Raffaello, bold and beautiful ships designed for a new Italian renaissance. The Italian line was very proud to represent the best of post-war Italian design. The top architects were commissioned to design the ships and they had a, a wonderful mix of minimalism with Italian flamboyance. La mer. But more than any other nation, it was de Gaulle's France that wished to recreate the pre-war glory of its ocean liners. All French hopes were placed in one showpiece ship called simply the France, the longest in the world by just four feet. It was a ship for the rich and the fashionable in their bijou apartment suites, 2,000 passengers pampered by over 1,200 crew. The French line ships were legendary. It was said that more seagulls followed French line ships than those of any other company, hoping to catch delectable bits of haute cuisine thrown out from the galleys. I think this was terrifically important to France, that the country itself, its culture, its design values, um, its engineering, were there to be seen uh, very much the France was very much a flag carrier, a national flag carrier, in that truest sense of a, a ship of state. She was very, very much a statement of France afloat. And originally they were going to build two fairly modestly sized liners, but during the de Gaulle era there really was the need for some great nationalist prestigious project and he chose the building of a great new liner which became the SS France which entered service in 1962. Un voyage comme les autres. Aussi le premier voyage. But even as these bold new ships enjoyed their maiden voyages, dark clouds appeared overhead. Jet aircraft started across the Atlantic non-stop in hours rather than days. The jet age was a body blow for the Atlantic liner companies. At first, they simply didn't know how to respond. They'd been coining money during the 1950s. Suddenly, just over a decade later, passenger numbers were dropping off. I think what's sometimes forgotten is that in those early days of airline travel, it was extremely expensive. But what happened was that the early airliners were taking out the first class passengers and it was the first-class passengers, essentially, who were paying 
for the, the paying the profits. Even in the late 1960s, Cunard were attempting to operate a year-round transatlantic service. And certainly in the latter years of their life, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth, sailing in the middle of winter, would sail with more crew members than they had passengers on board. Chic travel had moved to the skies. A new term was coined, the jet set for a group of the rich and the famous who lived la dolce vita in New York, London, Paris or Rome. The whole imagery of air travel began to dominate uh, the culture. So liners began to look increasingly dowdy, no matter how modern the ships themselves were. And that was a real problem. Suddenly, young boys wanted to be airliner pilots rather than to work on ships, for example, because that whole culture was the fashionable thing. Although the transatlantic lines enjoyed the prestige, the other great sea routes were where most of the money was made. The routes to Australia and New Zealand were popular, lucrative and effectively out of reach of long-range jets for the next decade. From the early 60s onwards, the premier ship on the six-week route to Australia was Pierno's Canberra. Peninsula and Orient Line had great success serving these long distance passages. Longer routes such as the routes from the UK to South Africa and the route down to Australia were still viable. Now these ships were still liners in the true sense but they were quite different from the Atlantic liners because they had to travel further distances before refueling and they also carried invariably a lot more cargo than the transatlantic ships. Liners went all over the world, just as airlines today, and certainly looking at this from a British perspective, throughout the whole period of the empire, the way that civil servants and visitors and friends and families travelled around the world was by liner. So whilst the transatlantic route had the prestige it had the famous liners they were in the minority most liners weren't on the transatlantic route some of the most popular liners featured the lavender colored hulls and black and red funnels of the union castle line ships that ran a scheduled service on the south atlantic routes to south africa union castle uh, it ran like clockwork literally um, it was always said that you know, when the Union Castle vessel blew a parting whistle at, I think it was four o'clock on a Thursday, um, you know, Southampton could set their watch by it. A purserette on the Edinburgh Castle during the 60s was Anne Haynes. Welcome to my bureau, my little office of Union Castle treasures. Pictures, various items of happiness and memorabilia in here. And of course, one of my favourite items is my curtain. A lovely gift from a friend in South Africa, but he and his wife only gave me the one curtain. But um, isn't it lovely with all the various Union Castle ships on it? Another little treasure that I like is an advertising item from the 1960s, where if I want to say I'm leaving the, on the um, Edinburgh Castle on a particular Friday, I could put the Edinburgh Castle against the day of the week for Southampton and then discover where the rest of the fleet are. It was an exciting adventure on a on a liner and we, we were on a voyage going from point A to point B to C to D and then back again the true liner voyage, I think. The cargo was varied. I've got records showing that um, things like heifers and cows and horses and lots of animals were carried on deck. Locomotives, railway locomotives were carried, all sorts of things. Wool from South Africa came to the UK. And one of the cargoes, of course, was gold bullion, which came from South Africa. I didn't know about this for a long time, but it just shows how secret it was, and I didn't know about things like that. 
and I was told that if I could lift one, I could have one. And you probably know how heavy they are, so of course I couldn't lift one. A favourite ritual on the Union Castle line was celebrating the crossing of the equator. One of the ceremonies that took part on the Union Castle ships was the crossing the line, and that was very much looked forward to. So there'd be King Neptune, there would be his queen, who was usually a male with balloons in strategic places, and weird and wonderful costumes. There would be a policeman, in a little tiny policeman's hat. All the victims for the crossing the line ceremony were volunteers. They knew they were going to get covered in revolting looking things. You've transgressed and upset the king, king of the um, undersea and King Neptune asks you to come here and account for your sins, you know, and put in a chair or put on a table. But everybody got a certificate with the name on, signed by King Neptune and the date. Lovely certificates. Anne sailed her last voyage on the Edinburgh Castle in 1967. For her, an era had passed. The late 60s were also pivotal years in the lives of the transatlantic ships. First the jumbo jet and then Concorde captured most of the passengers who would have travelled by ship a decade earlier. The final blow is the onset of the 747. When flying becomes a mass market and pretty well everybody who could have afforded to cross the Atlantic on a liner can afford to cross the Atlantic on an airliner. And then the liner becomes an anachronism. It's the end of that era. No passenger line could escape the new economic reality. Cunard had two ageing ships in the Queen's Mary and Elizabeth, ships designed in the 30s for a world now gone. They were old-fashioned and expensive to run. The much-loved Queen Mary bowed out in style in a long valedictory voyage to her new home in Long Beach, California. The Queen Mary was out at sea for 31 years. She's here in Long Beach now for 42 years. So she has become a, a, a part of Long Beach history uh, longer than she was out at sea. She is literally responsible for putting Long Beach on the map as a convention town. If you say Long Beach anywhere in the world, people say Queen Mary. If you say Queen Mary anywhere in the world, people say Long Beach. She's had good days and bad days money has been spent to try and keep her up, but she's still a very, very fine representation of one of the old ships of state. On the quayside, even an American-style celebration is dwarfed by the huge bulk of the old lady herself. The final commanding captain of the Queen Mary, Captain John Treasure Jones. Now, as the very last captain serving with Cunard of the Queen Mary, you brought her here. What sort of experience did you find that last voyage? Well, I found the last voyage a really thrilling experience in many ways, because I knew I was bringing this ship on an adventurous voyage, if you like, round Cape Horn, to a home where I felt she would be appreciated and become the jewel of the port of Long Beach in the center of their harbor here. So I, I didn't feel bad about it at all. In fact, I was delighted to bring her here. From time to time during rough weather, the Queen Mary would rock and she would roll and she would rock and she would roll. And if the passengers became seasick, looked a bit green, you know, about the face, they could look into the peach plate mirrors, see a health the complexion <laughs> and hopefully feel just a wee bit better. The Queen Elizabeth was always considered the Mary's dowdy sister. She was the unsung partner in the famous double act. Elizabeth was an altogether more modern ship than the Queen Mary. She had benefited from at least a decade's design development. On board, however, there's a bit of a paradox because the Queen Elizabeth was actually slightly more conservative in her design than the Queen Mary. She didn't have the Queen Mary's um, cult following, to put it 
in a modern parlance, she, she didn't quite hit it with the, the punters in the same way. Compared with Queen Mary, she was less warm, less comforting. Now, the Queen Elizabeth, she was sold to a Chinese businessman, C.Y. Tung, decided to buy the ship and to rebuild her as a floating university. And his idea was to sail the ship on long cruises with passengers and students. And the ship was undergoing a huge rebuilding program whilst anchoring Hong Kong. And towards the end of that process, in January 1972, the ship suddenly caught fire. The final death throes of this once great ship were reported by Blue Peter's Valerie Singleton. Soon the whole ship was alight, and despite all the efforts of the Hong Kong Fire Brigade, it became obvious that the liner was doomed. For five days and nights she blazed, and television viewers all over the world were appalled by these pictures. Now she caught fire in several places at once, and so it's assumed that it was the work of arsonists. And as with the Normandy in New York during the war, so much water was poured onto the ship to put out the fire that it made the ship unstable. And so she rolled over and sank and was subsequently scrapped. It takes a long time to cut up and carry away 83,500 tonnes of ocean liner. But every day she gets just a little bit smaller and soon even this rusting hulk will disappear. It's rumoured that the salvage is being sold across the border to mainland China. It's odd to think that the imperial grandeur of RMS Queen Elizabeth will end her days as scrap in communist China. This is the Blue Peter Annual from 1972, which I received uh, as a youngster for Christmas that year. And if we open up, one of the articles here is about the Queen Elizabeth, Queen of the Seas. And the very last paragraph reads, it was a sad moment for everybody who loves great ships. The Queen Elizabeth was the last of a great age, a superliner, and nothing like her will ever be built again. Well, it just so happened that at the time we were learning how to write letters of complaint at school. And my English teacher, Miss Bootle, she said the most important letter you can learn to write is a letter of complaint. So I duly wrote for my homework a letter of complaint to Blue Peter saying that when I grew up, I wanted to design and build a new ship that would rival Queen Elizabeth. And so I wrote and I sent it into Blue Peter, and lo and behold, I received by return the blue Blue Peter badge. And I was rather upset that they didn't give me a gold badge, I must say, I was very, rather precocious. Cunard had the confidence to commission a new ship to replace the retired Queen's Mary and Elizabeth. Like the Rotterdam, she would be dual purpose, a liner and a cruise ship. I name this ship Queen Elizabeth II. The Queen Elizabeth II, or QE2 as she is commonly known, became the flagship of the Cunard line for nearly 40 years. From 1969 to 2008, she was the most famous British liner of the modern age. Sleek and spacious, she was built to take Cunard into a new era. Now the big difference physically between the liner and the cruise ship is that the liner has to be significantly stronger than the cruise ship because it has to be able to be driven hard through bad weather. The bow of a liner is much finer, much more like an arrow. And again, it's to push its way through those rough weather. Now, all those things combined amounts to about a 40% increase in the price of the ship. So if you built a cruise ship and a liner of the same size, the liner would probably cost you about 40% more. And that's a big premium to pay to call your ship a liner. The QE2 really, in many ways, was the bridge between transatlantic liners of the traditional kind and modern day cruise ships. She was potentially able to operate as a two-class ship, equally as a one-class ship. She had all the facilities one would expect of a modern cruise ship. She was like a modern hotel on board. Her design was extremely progressive. She was rather jet age and also in many ways space age, both in her external design and in her internal outfitting. 
There were 50 luxury suites and 300 deluxe cabins. The QE2 was much more a floating hotel than a means of transport. The new ship attracted a visit from Blue Peter. After a fabulous lunch, I changed my clothes to go to the engine room, as I thought it would be very dirty. But it looked more like mission control at Cape Kennedy than on board a liner. There were dials, meters, switches, knobs by the dozen, each one controlling or metering some part of the engine, so that a constant check could be made by the control room's computer. On the bridge, I met the captain of the QE2. The QE2 also had the unique distinction of being the only Cunard liner to be captained by both father and son. Huge great wheels, of course, a relic to the past also, where yes. the wheel was right on top of the rudder. I first stepped aboard QE2 to visit my father when it was at Kingston, Jamaica, on a, on a cruise. And this was the very first time I'd been aboard the ship and I just couldn't believe what I saw, a fantastic modern ship, and that left me with the burning ambition to be captain of it one day. And I achieved my goal in 1990 when I was appointed relief master. But for the Dutch, the Americans and the French, the Atlantic game was up. In 1969, the Rotterdam, with her advanced design, moved exclusively into cruising was a sought-after ship for the next 30 years. But there was no escape for the gas-guzzling United States. Brute economics sank her as a going concern. Losing three million dollars a year, she was taken away for a refit and never returned to passenger service. The sudden loss of America's rocket ship left her devoted passengers high and dry. There are always some people who would, go, would always go by ship. We still get, I still get letters from people asking whether or not they can travel as a passenger even in these container ships that we're operating. They still want to operate in a, uh, run in a ship, but as far as operating a passenger ship the size of the United States, I, I rather doubt whether we could even assemble a crew, the type of crew we had, to operate that ship again because a lot of these people have retired, a lot of them have died off, and a lot of them have gone elsewhere. I do not think she'll ever go to sea. At one point, she was towed across to Turkey to have her asbestos removed, because of course, being an American ship, she was absolutely stuffed with asbestos for fireproofing reasons. The job was done, but the owners couldn't pay. So in lieu of money, uh, they paid by allowing the scrappers to take her lifeboats away, which were made of aluminium, and the davits. So the remains of the United States, the gutted shell, was then towed back across the Atlantic, and she now lies as a hulk in Philadelphia. Finally, even the world's longest ship, the France, the ultimate symbol of national pride, would fall. In 1974, with her $10 million subsidy removed by the French government, her owners were forced to concede that her days on the Atlantic run were over. France was laid up in Le Havre, her home port, for several years before she was bought by Norwegian Caribbean lines, and they had her rebuilt in Bremerhaven as the SS Norway. And she was a very, very successful cruise ship for many years in her modified form and has only recently been finally retired and sent for scrap. As the France, this ship was the last of the ocean greyhounds, built for speed and to dash across the North Atlantic in competition with other great liners. But in these days of rising oil prices, that's a recipe for economic disaster. Perhaps the most curious fate of all befell the France's predecessor, the Ile de France. The Ile de France was a very significant ship in that she was the first, effectively the first passenger ship to introduce the new Art Deco style. And she continued in service until the late 1950s when she was sold for scrap to a Japanese firm in Osaka. But it was the early days, those were the early days of the disaster movies. And before they scrapped her, the Japanese hired her out to an American film studio who were making a film called The Last Voyage. 
1,500 carefree passengers, happily unaware of a note to the captain. And they actually sent the ship out to sea and created various explosions inside and on the open decks, sent the forward funnel crashing down onto the bridge. All realistic, and I think um, the film actually won Oscars for the uh, special effects because they weren't made up, they were actually real, and you could see this great ship being destroyed for the purposes of the film. Hold it, the piano's gonna fall! Poor Dorothy Malone, who was a star of the film, spends about three quarters of the film up to her neck in water. Very difficult to give a good acting performance under those circumstances, I should have thought. Never before has the screen flamed with adventure and suspense so real, because every dramatic moment was filmed at fever pitch, entirely aboard the world's most glamorous luxury liner. Hurry it up, for God's sake, I can't keep ahead of the water much longer. She was then partially sunk for the finale of the film. The French were actually scandalised by the use of the Ile de France in this film and they ensured that all references to Ile de France were very carefully erased and in fact in the film the ship is given the name Claridon. I think that she was so much a ship of the, of the movie age, so many famous film stars had travelled on her. Her decor was so much, before the war, before it was changed, so much Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, that maybe that was a rather suitable final role for this, for this great ship, a starring role in, in, a, in, a, in a big budget movie. But not all liners met such a dramatic end. Most were adapted for the expanding cruising market. In 1981, Robert Robinson took a slow boat to Madeira. The ship was the former liner, the Canberra. It was now supposedly a one-class ship, but reminders of the old days were not hard to find. Where some passengers had every convenience, some had very few. Did you know you were in for this kind of thing? I mean, you're four strangers, as Ted just this minute said to me. That's yeah. right. Switch the video. Please. Right. I mean, force you knew you were in for this kind of yep. chummery. There again, it's economics. Um, a single cabin would have would have cost another two hundred pound extra. Mm. But I wanted the company. I look for company, and this is where you get it. Of course, uh, it was company I was after. But, but, but perhaps this situation wasn't quite the company I was looking forward to. Fairly early on in the cruise, people tend to split into fairly two fairly well demarcated groups. Um, the people in the cheaper cabins, the old second class, tend to congregate in the Alice Springs at lunchtime. What, what happens there? Well, the Alice Springs is the casual bar where the people sit in shirt sleeves and, um, you know, the old classic Blackpool and the braces syndrome. I want to play a little game with you A little game that's jointly made for two Whereas the people who are working up, who um, live up in the front end of the ship, the old first class, uh, days of the Raj, still sort of lives on up there. So, as it were at the top end, the Commodore hosts an alfresco cocktail party on his private deck. No, I, I wouldn't hear a word against it. I honestly wouldn't, mm. because it's just straightforward. And, uh, and I don't think you'll get a better value for money. While at the other end, it's pub night. Send the Irishman in. <laughs> <laughs> And <laughs> big Paddy walked in. He said, Now, Paddy, there's a cabbage up here and a knife. What's it doing without Paddy? He said, Jesus, or I reckon it's the cabbage. At the Commodore's party, one of the guests remembers what cruising was like in the 20s. They made their own amusements. They appointed a sports committee when they had the first day up, helped by the senior uh, officers on board. The 
following year, the Falklands War created new roles for the QE2 and Canberra. Like their predecessors in the Second World War, these welded leviathans were the only realistic means of transporting an army over long distances, in all seas, at speed. They're ready to fight if they have to, but we as we in the government will do our very, very best to see that that is not necessary. But if they have to, I know they'll acquit themselves with honour. How do you feel now as the ship's sailing away? Well, I think I'll be quite tearful in a few moments, actually. What about you? Just about the same, very tearful. Yeah. Something come back safely, that's the main thing. It took the QE2 just 16 days to reach the South Atlantic. These grand ladies could lift up their skirts when they had to. The QE2 was kept at arm's length from the Argentinians, but the Canberra was sent into San Carlos water, in the thick of the action. She received a heroine's welcome on the return to her home port of Southampton. By the 80s, the new cruise ships looked very different from the classic ocean liners of the past. Whereas traditional liners had their ladies' retiring rooms and smoking rooms and all kinds of spaces for simply sitting and relaxing, the modern cruise ship is built around revenue-earning spaces like bars, casinos and shops and the new purpose-built ships were designed in that way. It was only in the 1970s when cruising came for the mass market and that's when various new operators started like Royal Caribbean Line, Carnival Cruise Lines, Norwegian Cruise Line and they brought in specialist ships that were very very successful high-density ships that really supported the mass market. The love boat promises something for everyone. Said this new world was soon attracting drama treatment in the hit television series The Love Boat. Its glossy take on cruising helped to make floating holidays even more mainstream. The Love Boat, with its mixture of romance and comedy, changed middle America's perception of what went on in cruise ships. And it generated a huge boom in affordable cruising in the, U in the USA. The love boat herself was the Pacific Princess, uh, operated by a British company, operated by P&O. Here they come, out of the starting gate. <laughs> and this hit the imagination of the American public, so that uh, people maybe in middle America who had never dreamed, maybe never seen the sea, suddenly realized that cruising was not for the toffs. It could be fun. And there was always the hint of romance, drama, whatever. So the love boat really put mass market cruising on the map. One can never underestimate the power of television. Television was making cruising seem accessible. Travel programs were quick to democratise its packaged glamour. Parting can be such sweet sorrow, but not for long in a ship like this where you'll soon find plenty of shallow water to drop anchor again. The last thing you need in this heat is more heat. A good job then, there's so many pools like this on board. Naturally, a lot of activities are arranged around the pools, but I found there was still enough space to enjoy your own privacy if you so desired. But for those that have been before, what then's the appeal of a cruising holiday? Well, if you get on a beach and you get covered in sand, you get covered in people here, your room and your shower are just a few yards away, the bar stewards are passing by every couple of yards, uh, every couple of minutes, the pool is there to dive into, it is very easy. Thank you very much. They tend to do things in style on cruise ships. This is not a meal. It's in fact a drink, a blue Caribbean. And normally you'd probably have to carry around two wallet loads of money to pay for it. But like everything else on board, you simply pay for it with a credit card. Over the last 
for decades or so. The uh, cruise market has changed very much and cru cruise ships have changed very much. They're, of course, most of them are much bigger now. They have much better facilities. People now very often demand that they shall have a balcony outside their cabin. Um, and also, um, cruising has become, in real terms, very much cheaper than it was. How about coming into my room? Well, this is it. That's the shower room and toilet in there. You get a fridge, two single beds, there's a television. You get a telephone and you can actually phone home from the boat. This particular room has a balcony, which of course costs extra. It's independently air conditioned. And I'm sure as ship's cabins go, it's quite spacious. But if you have any ideas about bringing the sort of trunks that you see in the movies, well, I think twice. A cruise ship was not a means to transport its passengers. It was now a destination in its own right. A destination with no revenue stream untapped. Drinks cost extra and make carnival money. And they found a way to sell as many as possible. My salary is very small, about $48 a month. And then you get 15% of all your sales. If you don't run, you don't make money. That's the way it is. Passenger numbers soar, and by the turn of the century, two important milestones had been passed. Miami, with easy access to the Caribbean, became the largest passenger port in the world. And for the first time, the largest passenger vessel afloat was not a liner, but a cruise ship. Cruising is now very big business, and in the course of events, they've gobbled up a lot of the smaller companies. Well, I say smaller, um, for example, Carnival has taken over Cunard and one thinks of Cunard being a big company, but in today's world it was a mere minnow. More berths at sea at the moment. As we speak, more people are sleeping on cruise ships on the oceans than ever there were back in the liner era. And in an ironic twist, an old enemy was now a new best friend. It's strange to consider that the cruise industry today really does rely on the aeroplane bringing in vast numbers of passengers from all around the United States to the ports of Miami, Fort Lauderdale, New York and the other areas. So, whereas jet airliners had been disastrous for the liner trades, they were actually very advantageous for cruise ship companies because jet aircraft could fly passengers straight to sunny departure ports like Miami in shiploads. In 2008, the two great liners that had pioneered the transition to cruise ships sailed to their final resting places. First, the port of Rotterdam in the Netherlands saw her most famous ship come home. Against all expectations, and much to my delight, the, the one ship that um, was saved from uh, the uh, sort of 60s era of transatlantic ships, of course, is the SS Rotterdam, back in her home port and the port of her birth, back in Rotterdam. This ship was just too beautiful. To, to see off to a scrapyard. And so Rotterdam uh, has finally, after many misadventures, has finally found her way back to the port of Rotterdam. Um, there were amazing scenes. 4th of August last year, 2008. I feel so lucky to have been there. Um, the port was, was heaving immense numbers of people turned out. A huge flotilla accompanied her in. Uh, to be part of it was one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. The day that uh, the Rotterdam came back into our port was a celebration that gives you goosebumps. It was as if a lost child was welcomed home again. You can actually not really describe that feeling that uh, 
one didn't think about, but when one saw the emotions of the people here in Rotterdam, so proud and so tearful almost, seeing her back into port, knowing that she was going to stay this time. 400 workmen are now racing against time to open the ship as a museum and hotel in the summer of 2009. When restored, all the Rotterdam's period features, including the famous Odyssey murals by the Dutch artist Nico Nagler, will help preserve the legend that is the Rotterdam for future generations. Also in 2008, the QE2, once Cunard's flagship, and for a decade part of the Carnival Empire, bowed to the inevitable. After nearly 40 years on the oceans of the world, she was sent off in style to drop anchor in her new home of Dubai. And the idea is that um, her heritage, all the artefacts on board, will be um, on display to be able to show future generations just what a great ship the Queen Elizabeth II was. But the story of the ocean liner is not quite over. In 2004, a new queen was launched, the Queen Mary II. Once again, a Cunard ship is the largest, longest and fastest passenger ship afloat. The dream of the small boy who wrote to Blue Peter. My brief from my management was simple. I had to design a ship that could be constructed in the modern era using modern materials and modern methods that would be able to do the transatlantic route and that would make the same return on investment as if we had spent the money on building cruise ships for cruise service. The Queen Mary II is an attempt by Cunard to recapture what they want to promote as being the golden age of liner travel. Her hull is absolutely that of a liner. The naval architect Stephen Payne who designed her is, an, is a very, very brilliant man. And in designing that vessel, he actually had to look back to ships from the 1960s in order to find the inspiration for a hull form that would be able to sail across the Atlantic quickly all year round. Up top, however, the QM2 is most definitely a cruise ship. This is a ship, a high-tech, super-modern ship, dressed in historic fancy clothes. One of the things they are selling is the heritage. And although they are now American-owned, largely American-owned, uh, they still want to give a, a rather British atmosphere. And to think something as amazing as this was inspired by Blue Peter. Now, Steve, I, I see that you've got a nice nautical type in there. Would never be without it. I've got something even better than that, which I hope you'll never be without. Here. Wow. Yes, <laughs> it is our highest accolade, a gold blue peter badge. I'm going to pin it on you. Wow, that's marvellous. But you didn't think you'd get this as a young child writing into I the show. I certainly didn't. Congratulations. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls. Have a fantastic day on board the Queen Mary, and thank you for coming on board. Next tonight, an incredible feat of engineering with big risks. Horizon follows the attempt of the British Antarctic Survey to move their base several kilometres across ice. 